Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some. Thank you for joining us today for our keynote talk at the AI and Product Summit. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about thinking beyond the chatbots. Uh, my name is Salim Malkana. Let me introduce myself briefly. I am a product and growth advisor. Um, I'm focused on AI transformation. To tell you a little bit about what that means and a bit about my background, let me uh, share it for a minute. Uh, my background in the last 15 to 20 years has been in product and growth. I started off actually in aerospace engineering with a brief stint at the CIA. Nothing that I work on goes into space or flies anymore, but my advisory is called paper plane. So you'll see little paper plane graphics on this presentation. Uh, more recently, I got kind of my product foundation at Amazon in the early days of Prime Video, building out kind of mobile and uh, the iOS experience worldwide. Then I moved to a startup within New York where I built zero to one for the subscription startup, as well as helped grow the business from zero to $50 million in ARR. Uh, after that, I led teams in product design and research at NBC, overseeing the news brands. Uh, and then seeking something a little bit more entrepreneurial, I joined the team at Reforge, a career development platform about Series B backed, um, that is uh, really leading the charge in product and growth. So I joined as an executive in residence to uh, to lead these product and growth programs to help product managers and growth managers upscale in their career. Uh, that's also opened me up to great advising opportunities, which is what I'm doing now, both in my background in product led growth, as well as in AI transformation. To give you an example of you know, what that means, one of my engagements right now is with a large venture capital firm exploring how to leverage generative AI to better deliver some of their advisory services um, in different kind of go-to-market actions, for example. So how do you make sense of what, what's available, the data that we have, and how do I leverage that using generative AI to actually do something really novel and different? Today, our goal is to really shift from the idea that, hey, we can launch a chatbot. That's great. That was honestly kind of amazing a few months ago, but it's not enough anymore. Now we need to ask, how do I leverage AI to solve a customer problem? And what are some different approaches? Uh, in order to do that, some of today's goals and non-goals, which I think is my first tip as a product manager to have explicit non-goals. Uh, the goals are to remind us of a strong product foundation and why we build products instead of not just AI chatbots. Uh, and second, to feel energized by a few different ways to leverage AI in your products, I'm going to talk about four different ways to think beyond the back and forth chatbot. Some non-goals, but I'm happy to geek out in Q&A. It's not a technical deep dive. This is obviously not a comprehensive course on AI. I probably won't have robust predictions on the future of work, uh, and we won't be discussing consequences of artificial general intelligence, but again, very happy to geek out in Q&A. One other thing this definitely is not, this is not a seven chat GPT tips that will blow your mind or how to use prompt engineering the best. This is not a Twitter thread. So with that, let's jump in. In our agenda today, we're gonna to talk about that strong product foundation that I mentioned. Then we're gonna talk about chatbots and why they're good and how it's an on-ramp to generative AI. We're gonna talk about the next steps in conversational AI. Then we're gonna talk about those four other ways, those four other predictions that I think the world and products like yours will change beyond chatbots. We'll talk briefly about the future and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay, I hope everyone's ready. So the origin of this, why are we here? You know, I shared this with my network. I'm not normally a LinkedIn meme guy, but I shared this and it resonated a lot. You know, someone saying, I'm shipping an AI feature and responding, cool, does it solve a customer problem? And then the first guy just getting angry. And I think that this, is indicative of some of the work that's happening right now, which is interesting and experimental and figuring out what works and what doesn't work and what you can do and what you can't do. And that's all very interesting, but we have to remind ourselves that we need to solve a customer problem. And that's hard right now because AI is everywhere. AI is exploding. It's in the news everywhere. And this is actually just not even all the news. This is, I think, just a snapshot from the New York Times. Um, and there's just a lot of AI news every minute, every day, the days, what happened today in AI, this week in AI, this hour in AI. And so you might think with all this hype, I think I've seen this hype cycle before. Is this just the crypto hype cycle all over again? I'm here to reassure you, this is not just the AI, the, the crypto hype cycle. This is much more real uh, and interesting and multi kind of de deep. Now, I will say AI has real tangible use cases and benefits. And now as AI gets a hundred times better and 10 times cheaper, you're gonna suddenly find it helpful in a thousand times more use cases. And as product managers, we need to go figure out what are the top 
five or 10 that we want to go dive into uh, and ignore the other 900 that might be tempting. But yes, let me admit, there is a lot of hype. So because of that, because of that hype, because of that confusion, because of how easy it is to spin up a chatbot, I wanted to start this talk really, as I said, there's kind of two sides to this. The first is on building that strong product foundation. And the second will be around four ways that I think that AI and products will develop beyond chatbots. So as product managers, no one has ever said our job is to build, right? Our job is not just to build stuff. Our job is to build experiences that deliver value to our users and that support our business goals. What does that mean? That means that we need to understand how we're helping users, how we're driving the business forward and have that kind of as our North Star. I have seen really in my experience, that means that you largely want to map yourself to the customer lifecycle and that you should be really thinking about how am I impacting customer acquisition, activation and onboarding that leads to retention and deep customer engagement. And ultimately, how do I layer in monetization and what is my strategy? Not just what is my pricing, but what is my overall monetization strategy, of how I monetize when to whom and to what degree, of course, that, that drives a successful product. Now, if you're not building to one of these goals and you don't know how to measure success, which is critical, then you need to pause and rethink. Because I think another chatbot on searching your website or searching these PDFs or docs or your knowledge base is a cool experiment, but it might not be actually meaningfully moving your customer behavior uh, and driving towards acquisition, retention, and engagement or monetization. So I'm here partially with my uh, Amazonian background to say, to remind everyone, Customer centricity really is the method to remain laser focused on what matters. This was true yesterday. This is true today with the advent of the age of AI. This will be true tomorrow as AI tools, uh, infrastructure, and more get more and more robust. It's going to be really important to figure out what does the customer want and how do I deliver that? Now, some quick alternatives to, I think, rule out. You can be kind of feature and technology centric, which is tempting here in with the age of AI. You can be competitor centric or we could talk about conference room centric for a second. So if you're feature centric and you never talk to users, I'll give you an example of where this leads to. This is a real thing. This is the smalt. This is the uh, first smart salt dispenser. And I think that this has a lot of features, but doesn't necessarily having, has not really talked to their users, but it's got a lot of technology. It is your Bluetooth enabled salt dispenser. It has an LED mood light. It has a speaker to stream your favorite songs. It's controllable via iOS or Android. So they have a mobile marketplace lockdown, Alexa enabled, Google Home TBD, and it can change before four dispensing modes. I think pinch, pour, shake, and like deluge. I don't know. There's a lot of salt that can be, that can come in that fourth dispensing mode. But this is clear to us, right? This is an example of using technology where the customer has not asked for it. Uh, and I want to draw that parallel to making sure that we drive and develop products that matter to customers today, when now it's so much easier to spin up products, especially in AI, especially in building out a chatbot. And I'll get to the point on kind of what I mean on what that baseline is. The second is you can be competitor centric. You can watch my competitors. You can parrot their features. You can try to react very quickly. This is, I think, one of my favorite office, office uh, clips. Um, but where does that lead us? Being competitor centric will bring you often into closer competition, not differentiation. If the competitor is on the wrong track, you're actually following them there off the cliff. If the competitor is on the right track, you're going to get there slower. So what does that mean? That means you really need to pay attention to competitors, but don't obsess. So you might say, you're, you might say, or rather your, your executives might say, what's our AI strategy? Our competitor has an AI strategy. They have a chatbot. What do we want to do? That's why I wanted to kind of gather us today. And that executive might also be in a conference room centric decision making. I can't see everyone's faces today, but I know many of us have been in this pain point. This is sad. This we've all been in this kind of like this valley of despair where you have some combination of muddled decision making across a conference room or hippo, which is the highest uh, highest paid person's opinion that carries the decision. So these are all our alternatives to to being customer centric. So I will just lean into the cliche. I'll give you know the the Bezos photo from 1996, where he's first saying, you know, like, rather than ask what we're good at or what we can do with that skill or technology, we have to ask who are our customers and what do they need? Uh, and then we're going to give that to them regardless of whether we have the skills to do so. We'll learn those skills no matter how long it takes. So I wanted to kind of ground us in that healthy customer obsession and that health, healthy approach to product foundation with thinking about acquisition, 
activation and onboarding that leads to retention and healthy engagement and ultimately monetization. I want those to really be one of those to be your North Star in what you're building, often in retention and engagement. And we can talk in Q&A about how to measure that potentially if that's an area of interest. Okay, so let's get the baseline, chatbots. Chatbots are uh, have really become the standard in AI products and are starting to be everywhere. I see multiple product hunt launches daily and they're awesome. And I think they're doing a lot here, but there's other chatbots that are really just some initial tooling and experiments. And I want to, today to challenge everyone to think beyond that. So right now this UX is novel, but it's also intuitive because we are conversational people. Uh, that op the open AI API and some simple tooling makes this really easy to implement. Um, and here, this text in, text out chatbots is really the baseline that I want to establish that it talks and, and back and forth, but it doesn't do too much more than that. This is the we can chat with our site feature. This is the we can chat with our docs feature. And I'm here to tell you, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. I see this really becoming first more robust conversational UX. And what does that mean? That means that we're going to get to conversational UX that not just chats, but also acts. Um, and this will be a main use case for many due to the uh, abilities of OpenAI's like embedding API and some updates they're making, as well as data privacy abilities, uh, data security abilities. Um, and last but not least, this is also getting better daily. Uh, you know, I had to update this talk yesterday because OpenAI dropped an update with function calling, which supports more reliable, like kind of richer chatbot experiences. So that means that they're, we're able to, developers are more, are able to more reliably get structured code output um, uh, better than ha had their prompt engineering prior to that. What's an example of how how this looks like when it when conversational UX acts and not just chats? I'm going to use an example of uh, this calendar app that I love called VimCal. So a shout out to their small but but strong team. They get a lot of Calendly links, so they're showing an ability to take a Calendly URL, drop it into VimCal, and instead of just telling you, "Hey, here's what's free and here's what's not, here's what's matching and here's what's not," VimCal is actually now understanding the the free times from Calendly, either from a URL or a screenshot. It's now acting to show you within the software uh, meeting times that work for you. And then you can then be the decision maker, the human decision maker that acts and says, this is the time that I'm going to select for you know the next meeting that I need to take. I wanted to give this example as a conversational UX that is not just, hey, when are you free? Here's when they are free. Here's what I, when I, what I want to do, but rather is acting uh, on your behalf. So... Step one is conver is conversational AI that acts, not chats. Um, when is conversational AI helpful? We all love a good two by two matrix. I wanted to kind of put this in everyone's brain and have this be a starting point for discussion. In my opinion, I see these two axes of frequency from left to right and complexity from simple to complex on the vertical axis. And I think as product managers, we should really think about chatbots in this bottom right corner where you have frequent occurrences of, that a customer needs, that they would go to this chatbot frequently as well as continued throughout their user experience. And they handle things that are simple, either text out or now getting more and more complex with the function calling updates that OpenAI has dropped and the ability for conversational UX chatbots to act and not just chat. If you're in another one of these contract quadrants where it's rare, where you have a rare need from a customer that might not be the strongest customer fit, or if it's a if it's complex, like I need to buy a house, that might not be something that I need to rely on a chatbot for. Okay, so let's talk beyond the chatbots. I'm going to make a prediction here, and it's hard to predict more than two to three weeks out or two to three months out, but I'll 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 put myself out there to say that I think products will, will transform in AI in four ways beyond text chatbots that I want to talk about. The first will be generative. The second, declarative the third predictive, and the fourth a bonus. So you'll have to stick around. So again, it's really hard to see around corners here. I have no magic crystal ball. I have no magic AI conversational chatbot that's telling me the future. I'm just trying to help kind of get us kind of kickstarted in how we're thinking. And if I've at least gotten you to go from chatbots that help us query our docs, that help us query our website, that respond to our users, but don't act. If I've already gotten you to more robust uh, conversational AI that acts, I'll take that as a win. Let's first talk about generative. We all know kind of the term generative AI, and we've seen this in action. This is the most familiar to a lot of us. You see things like text transformation, summarization, translation, synthesis, expansion. This is a lot of the classic ChatGPT, Notion AI, Jasper AI. You have uh, 
things happening multimodal, going from audio to text, like Otter AI and other uh, meeting transcription products. You have the uh, the the synthesis that just happened in that VimCal example that I gave you. Um, and then you have other things like presentation creation with things like Gamma. This is unfortunately a Google Slides creation. This is not made with Gamma. I apologize there, but maybe the next deck will be made with Gamma. And as I said, ChatGPT's function calling update, which came out yesterday, um, is really a game changer, I think, here because it helps developers keep, it helps the reliability of of the output to more to closely adhere to the structured format that you need in a JSON response or something similar like that. The second is a declarative approach. This is actually borrowing a term from computer science. So if you are like me, you might be having some mild PTSD from your undergraduate experience. Um, it borrows a term around imperative code, which focuses on writing explicit commands uh, and declarative code focus on specifying the result of what you want. I borrowed this image from Dharmesh, the CTO of HubSpot, who had a phenomenal talk on this. Um, and they're building out actually a lot of very innovative declarative uh, and chat UX focused products at HubSpot. So in the past, you've seen these software, especially a lot of SaaS tools that are point and click and point and click and point and click. And six or seven steps later, the user has achieved their goal of getting to that end outcome. But now with AI, if you can describe, if you can declare that goal state, you want to try to get the AI to, again, act on your behalf within the system and try to achieve things for you. So you'll see a trend here in what I'm talking about, that there we are going beyond just talking and conversation and help me understand something with text and actually getting to the doing and acting. And what can I act within my software or within the broader world? This latter approach is the declarative approach, um, and it works very well when you can specify what that goal-driven AI feature is. And when you have to do a lot of tedious actions and you can do navigation when to achieve a lot of tedious actions or navigation to achieve that complex task. So again, ChatSpot is an example of HubSpot's leaping ahead in this space for a large company, really impressed by what they're doing there. Uh, and then again, I've put that VimCal logo. So I'm giving a, a lot of love to these guys. I, I do love using this in my calendar, but I wanted to really highlight here that these four predictions that I'm making are not mutually exclusive, right? and they're certainly not exhaustive because there's going to be a lot that happens in AI that we don't cover today here. But you will find these products that are both generating text as well as taking a declarative approach to help me jump ahead as a user. Okay, the third, predictive. I think as users, we're already used to having products that make predictive um have predictive elements in their user experience. And often we actually find this at the cohort level, current logos on the screen aside. So if I see someone, uh, if I have a new user, that's a user segment, I'm gonna give them a different user experience. I'm gonna call it the first time user experience or my onboarding flow or my activation flow or my getting them to the aha moment, whatever I call it, is because I've targeted them as a new user. You can see other targetings of users, whether by geography, whether by uh, other types of like enterprise or small business users, people are increasingly kind of targeting their uh, their user experiences. And then getting to consumer apps like TikTok and Netflix. If anyone else has gotten addicted to, to TikTok because their for you algorithm is just too attuned to like what is interesting, um, you'll find that like that the predictive AI is already getting quite good excluding Instagram reels here maybe, but um, you know that's gonna continue to happen. So I'm, I'm predicting that more and more granularity, including with individual personalization or potentially individual model fine tuning is coming. Um, and I think that that will happen when there is, especially that individual fine tuning at the right account, You know the ACV values that make this make sense, that might not happen at the consumer level, but more at the enterprise level, um, that, 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 that that granularity can definitely happen at the individual level. Now, we will say that ranking and AI ML will, may progress very differently because large language models are somewhat of a fundamentally different approach and different type of kind of machine learning than some of the ranking algorithms that, that exist uh, in that space. So this may go in a different way. This may be going more and more off of how, how do I create the embeddings that create the persona so that my when I if I am still using the OpenAI's API, I'm now actually calling that with a much more clear version or vision of who that customer persona is. Okay, and now the fourth, the bonus. This is the more most out there, and uh, here it's described as agentic. 
Um, I'm going to describe it a little bit more because people might be a little less familiar here. Uh, but we're in the very early days of agents like Baby AGI and Auto GPT. What are these agents? These are user-facing products that resemble something like ChatGPT. So I can use it as a user on my computer. But these agents are not limited to one prompt and one response and are also not limited to one single kind of one agent. They aim to take that main goal in this declarative approach that I've been talking about, break that down into smaller goals and milestones and operate against that. It may then break those smaller milestones into other preliminary steps and act on those tasks in a in an iterative and almost like in a recursive way here, where it's not just one chat GPT responding to me, but actually breaking out into the five tasks that might help achieve this and breaking that into the 25 subtasks that do that. And then figuring out what can I achieve in that either by understanding what I what I can from the corpus of information from, for example, chat GPT, from searching the web, from taking some other action, things like that. We are in very early days here. So it's really hard to know kind of where this goes, uh, where this goes next. But if this continues to, to expand, if agents become more and more um, capable, then we might want to ask, how might our product leverage agents on behalf of users? How might I uh, incorporate this into my product? If agents become commonplace amongst Copilot apps and like, spoiler alert, Copilot apps are coming for all PMs, for all marketers, for all people in this room, probably depending on our function, different services will bring you Copilot apps. How do I potentially market to those agents differently than I market to my users? Um, and then that gets to the product side of it, which is how do I create agent-facing experiences versus user-facing experiences? So we've just spent maybe about 30 years improving the user-facing experience on web. We went from kind of initial web standards. We got to responsive web. We got to mobile experiences. We know exactly kind of like what makes an accessible, clear site for users. That's all maybe a little different for agents that are actually understanding this from a purely technical or API, almost an API uh, level approach where it's really just trying to get information from you and it actually doesn't care about the entire rendering that's happening on the screen. And it also probably doesn't see ads. So that that calls into question that kind of monetization approach. So I think this will potentially be one of the most impactful trends, but it's also the earliest days here. So, and, and also it was the most, I think, um, susceptible to hype on things like uh, on, on the Twitter threads. So it, I want to caveat that it's early days here. We're going to figure this out all together. Okay. So a bit of a cheat sheet, what it is and when to use it. We've talked about conversational AI and really elevating chatbots from searching my records to really having the chat plus act ability for high frequency, low to medium complexity tasks. We have generative uh, generative products when you can quickly deliver value, especially via API. Declarative, when your product is a point and click disaster, that's when you need to use that. Predictive, when you have many, many different customer segments, you think that you can actually attune uh, the marketing or product experience. And lastly, agentic, I will say this is TBD here because this is the most new. Okay, so let's briefly talk about the future. Um, I can absolutely say this for Q&A to go deeper, but I just want to kind of prime everyone in thinking on where we are in this kind of cognitive hierarchy. I think that in the past, you've seen kind of automation and machine learning executing orders. So, hey, deploy this marketing campaign. Now you see more and more on the analysis. Hey, analyze customer segments performing, performance. Un, help me understand the numbers. Help me transform or like synthesize conclusions from the numbers. I feel like this is kind of a you are here moment where we're now getting to recommendations, recommend me, for example, new targeting, new creative, a new mix of spend. Again, I'm giving examples here in the marketing lens, but you'll find the same um, marching from execution of orders, analysis, recommendations in product and in other functions. Beyond recommendations, then that might get to strategic thinking, make large go-to-market decisions, make new, figure out new opportunities, figure out new partnerships, act on those things, establish those connections, this is kind of where we're not quite at this frontier just yet. Uh, and then lastly, maybe most scarily, maybe most excitingly, autonomy, right? If this is do this all without the roadblock of humans to slow it down. We are not there yet. Baby AGI, auto GPT, these do not do this. I will say, I would say, but sometime in the future, I think that you might find artificial intelligence continuing to climb this cognitive hierarchy. And so I think as product managers, we want to understand how do we leverage it? How do we leverage it to help customers? How do we leverage it to build our business? And what does that mean beyond search my docs, search my 
site create a chat bot for my users to 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 talk to if this can help your users act in a declarative way if this can help your users from a predictive perspective or if agents become more of a thing then things get really interesting so um I'll close by saying that the companies that leverage AI to move faster and better while ignoring hype and bullshit will be the ones that win in the next decade. So I want everyone to remain laser focused on that, that there is a lot of hype. There's a lot of bullshit. It's interesting. It's it's hard to know kind of exactly what's real. But if you dive into this and you build customer experiences that matter to users, um, then you'll win and you'll do well. So with that, thank you so much for listening today. I really appreciate your time here. Uh, there is one obnoxious QR code on the screen here. This is really to just to to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to know what you thought of the talk today, what you're thinking about within your product organization. If you find that you, that you are in a conference room centric decision making scheme and you need a therapy session on how to get out of that, or if you're talking about, hey, I'm in the what is our AI strategy mandate from executives or build a chatbot mandate from executives, and we need to think a little bit more holistically about our customer experience and how we're making it better, um, for sure, reach out. Um, my advisory works across things like AI transformation, product-led growth, product strategy, product team building, uh, and more. So I would love to hear from you. Um, and I think that we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, about AI in the Q&A coming up right now. So thank you. Let's see, we've got some questions coming through. Um, okay, so one question comes through saying, in your opinion, what's the best way to learn, stay up to date, and start using these technologies for our product and our customers? There is a lot of information out there, right? Like we've just talked about this, that like there's an overflow of information. Um, I will say like I probably read too many newsletters uh, that to try to stay up to date. I would probably not subscribe to any sort of daily AI newsletter, stick to a weekly, figure out what's happening um, because too much is happening in any given day. You want to really understand the trends that are happening in a given week. Um, so most recently I've been reading things like the rundown. I think that's that's quite approachable uh, for all sorts of product managers. And I think that that's one that I would recommend. Next, I would talk about kind of figuring out if you can, if you can join or start some sort of community where you can have like-minded folks to talk through. I think that this is so hard to navigate just solo and figuring out what you can do. And I think the best kind of creative juices, the best kind of technical solutions come from when you can talk through the talk through these things with someone else, whether remote or in person. So if there's like a Slack community to join, something like that, um, I think that there's already a number out there. I've toyed with the idea of starting one, but I think that there are already good ones out there. Um, so see what you can join in terms of a community to kind of talk through technical solutions. And then last, figure out within your company who or where is there kind of an interest and ability and opportunity to prototype these things. And like, I just kind of spent some time talking about how just, just chat bots that just talk back and forth is not the future, but it is a great on-ramp, right? It is the great way to start. So if that's where you and a team want to start to figure out what can we do with our data? How can we figure out how to help customers? That could be an okay place to start. And I would figure out where in my company can I start to experiment with AI products? Where can I prototype this? Where do I have really willing kind of like design and engineering counterparts who want to jump into this? Okay. Um, let's take another question. I can only see some here. Um, what are the current advanced areas of AI in cognitive areas? For example, accelerated expertise in IQ augmentation. This is uh, maybe a little out of scope. So the, the question is around IQ, IQ augmentation and um, AI in cognitive areas. To whatever, to the extent that I'm a product expert and an AI expert in a very changing field day by day and week by week, I cannot tell you on neural and IQ augmentation. I'm not sure if I'm an expert on that one. So I can't, I can't help you there. But if anyone finds uh, some way to kind of take that limitless, limitless pill and become the IQ 200 or IQ 300 um, to move us forward and potentially protect us against a future of, uh, of AGI that we need to figure out kind of like how to solve the alignment problem. I am all ears. I think it's a very interesting problem to solve and I'm very excited um, and want to uh, approach this future cautiously, but cautiously optimistic. Okay. With that, I know we are at time. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Last chance to please take that QR code or just shoot me an email or reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. 
Thank you so much. Take care.